Welcome everyone to Cisco Canada's virtual live show. I'm Jay Ashton. I'm the business resources and brand activation manager plus host of our virtual kitchen show plus our podcast show. Uh, I do a lot of other things. Uh, I don't I don't park trucks yet, but probably that will be in the list soon. But uh, I'm excited about today because we're going to talk about produce. And holy cow, is there a lot to know about produce. So we have many shows. We're going to be like 2022 talking about produce still because it's endless. And we've got some experts today, amazing people. So I'm going to introduce them here in a second. And uh, yeah, this is going to be a great show. I'm, I'm excited. So I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce. Hello, guys. Hey, Jay. Good morning. Good morning. Well, for everyone that's watching us, which I don't know, you guys draw a lot of people into the show because we have a huge audience today. Um, but nice. it, must be, it must be you, Jeff. It's definitely you. Yeah, you absolutely. It. We'll go with that. Followers, sure. you're up all night. Um, yeah, anyways, we have absolutely. Jeff Phillips on the, on the show today, and Jeff's going to be joining us on our Produce Talks um, for many shows ahead. Uh, Jeff's the director on an ongoing of basis in Canada for marketing produce. Yes. Eastern Canada. Hope sure. I said that right. We'll go with all of those. Yeah, we'll That's take awesome. any of those for sure. That's no problem. That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. And we got TJ down there with Chef. What's your dog's name, brother? Well, this is my uh, sous chef. This is Raymond. He uh, He's here to assist us today on making sure everything is nice and fresh. <laughs> awesome. And TJ, you're out east. You're out west here with me. Out uh, west. Yeah. Oh, and west. Out of Curry. Oh, I'm the uh, I'm the produce specialist based out of um, well produce specialist for Alberta for Cisco Food. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, welcome, and we're excited. Thanks, I tell you, you are a world of knowledge in produce, and uh, <laughs> it's awesome. And you get you've even given me notes to follow along, so I won't screw up too much today. But uh, I'm just I'm really happy to talk about this because this is an area I find. With most restaurateurs and most people in our industry, uh, a lot of perception they know exactly everything about produce. And I, you know, I brag sometimes myself, I know a lot about produce, but just talking with you guys, I don't know anything about produce now. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a big area, especially for costs that are associated to it. Um, we need to help our restaurateurs out there help save money and make money. So today is a really Big discussion around shelf life, buying best decisions on produce, and really have a great discussion. I see a lot of people are adding comments today, which is great. So Thank let's, you. Uh, add, you know what, you guys want to, our viewers, if you want to ask questions to these experts, please do. Yes, um, ask yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're going to move on here. So let's get started here, gentlemen. Yeah. And uh, let's, let's, sure. let's talk produce. Let's talk a little produce. So let yeah, me so for me, yeah, I was gonna say, you know, I think the one thing this is, I mean, I think TJ and I are biased for sure, but, you know, I think it's the one category we we relate to our customers more than probably any other category. Um, you know, on a week-to-week -week basis, if you think of yourself as a family, you're not necessarily going out buying tenderloin steaks and, and shrimp every week, but, you know, every single family is buying produce for home. And you know what? We have the same struggles at home that we do in the industry, right? How do you make that last? You know, who hasn't gone to make dinner? You know, tonight you plan, you know, pork chops and some kind of a mixed green salad. And, uh, you know, so six o'clock tonight, your mixed green salad is a little bit wilty or, or blackened. So we have the same kind of issues so that we can all really, really relate to some of the challenges. And that's what, you know, we do want to talk about is how do you kind of extend that shelf life? What's the best way to store something? Because it is the same challenges that you face at home. And, you know, and I think the other thing is we were talking about this just a little bit uh, a few minutes ago. Is that if you know you think of produce, we all have great memories around it. And you know, when you walk into a grocery store, the first spot they drop you into is the produce section. I mean, it, it's full of, you know, sizes, shapes, colors, smells uh, that kind of really gets everyone's interest going. And you talk to chefs, like what really kind of drives them. And, you know, you hear about chefs going to a farmers market. That's where they get mm -hmm. the inspiration for, you know, the specials that night. It it's not walking through the meat cooler necessarily. It, it's finding what really cool produce kind of hits the nerve. 
that really kind of you know excites people. So that's why I think it, it, it's a great category to talk about. There's lots to know about it, but it's something that we can all really relate to on on a very base level because we you know we buy and purchase it every single week at home too. Yeah, and it's such a big part of our life, right? Like it's just it's everywhere, and it's something that you know we should be consuming every day, and lots of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. And you know, yeah. Just start with you guys, we know very little about it, which is bizarre, um, but definitely an area. And that's what we're doing today's show is really to educate more people about it and have a great, just casual conversation about it. And TJ, by the way, your dog is getting like huge reviews. He's single. He's single. <laughs> Three shows later, and your dog is a winner. <laughs> well, he is the best. He is the best ever. So, where, where do you guys want to start about this? Let's talk about. Well, I think Jeff touched on a couple of good yeah. points, right? Like we were talking about just produce in general and, and, you know, kind of what do you do when you go home and what do you want to eat? And usually everybody's looking for, they will kind of start with a protein and then what's the side? Or if I'm going to have a salad, I kind of open my fridge and kind of think, well, what do I have? So it would be the same thing when you're in a kitchen that you want to have almost like a mental log of what you have in your cooler, what you have in the kitchen, and just look at the produce, see where it's at. Produce was a living thing. And then it's slowly, it's still alive, slowly on its way out, out of the world. So, you know, you want to find that you want to look through your produce, make sure that you're using the produce that is potentially going to turn faster um, and just treating it with all that good care. So, again, we, we took, we're kind of talking about, uh, you know, proper storage and proper storage all starts with temperature. Um, also, it starts with how you buy. Like there's so many different aspects um, when it comes to produce from even how you source it and who you're buying from and what did that person do to your produce or what are their growing procedures or what are their, uh, um, their cold chain procedures? So how do they deliver the product? How does it end up at the end user? So um, we can see also in the grocery store, I mean, the grocery store just kind of puts everything out on display and, and much like you, you gentlemen were talking about, they want you to come and grab that produce, but they also don't really, I don't want to say, I'm not saying anything bad, but it's not like they're, they're just putting it at ease of access for everybody to grab it. And then you got to get it home as fast as possible and put it in your fridge. If you were to leave it in your car, uh, you know, for a couple hours, you're rapidly breaking down that produce. So you're losing about a day for every hour that it's outside of the proper time window. So we really want to make sure that the cold chain is met all the way through from harvest in the field, all the way into, um, kitchens, customers, um, consumers, anybody, home kit, uh, home fridges, all that. So it's definitely very important to, uh, to make sure that we're, we're keeping it in that cold, that cold temperature zone. So for most produce, the temperature zone is around one to four degrees or one to about one to five, the majority of produce can fit in there. Um, but it gets, it kind of, everything starts getting really complicated because you got to break everything down to what is the item. And, you know, we have a difference of there's types of warm veg, there's types of veg that want to be in a, in a warmer range of anywhere of that kind of five to 13 degree range. And um, we see more of those warmer veg being things like um, softer skin squash, eggplant, tomatoes, uh, peppers, uh, chili peppers, anything like that will, will definitely want to be in that, that warmer range, even citrus. Citrus is maybe one that surprises people because I, everyone, of course, stores everything in the, the fridge, but you, you'd you want your citrus kind of in that 10 to 13 degrees Celsius. And, you know, I, ideally uh, in your in your fridge, your fridge is set up to make different temperature zones. And that's why we have crisper drawers and, and, and pull out drawers so that we can organize the, the fridge according to what we are putting in there. Most people just kind of cram everything in and just kind of move on. Um, in a kitchen, it's kind of the same thing. You got to look at your cooler, like different temperature zones. Um, and everybody's been there with, you know, always the best example is basil. If you put basil in the fridge and it goes black, everyone thinks it's usually a quality issue, but it ends up most of the time being a temperature abuse issue. So hey, TJ, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, ask away. I, mean, I can sit here all day. We'll just let TJ go for it because you're brilliant. <laughs> but I do want to ask, because I can, Jeff may laugh a little, and this is more, this is more for home. <laughs> Those little buttons in the crisper. I don't know how to set those. I'm sorry, but I don't know if everyone else is the same way, but is it high moisture, low moisture? Like those, you know what I'm talking about? Those little slidey yeah. things you put there? It really depends on what you're putting in there. And so okay. it really depends on what you want to, what you're going to put in there. And you also like, you got to, if, if you ask somebody like me, I'm going to probably tell you to put a, ther a thermostat or a thermometer in your drawers and see yeah. what the temperatures are at and then kind of go from there. Yeah. Because <laughs> even using those dials, you know what, what's tried and true is temperature. 
So even for, you know, all my chef friends, anybody that's, that's watching the easiest way to tell the temp uh, of a steak, if it's done or not, is just thermometer it, right? You put the thermometer in, you find out. So finding out what the exact temperature is in that zone will help guide you to what you should do because you never know. There could be a crack in the, in the paneling and the cold air is blowing in the back and you have no idea. So, but the idea on the, on the, the, the crisper and the, the, I yeah. guess what the slidey dial or whatever you want to call it <laughs> is to add a, basically increase the humidity or decrease humidity. So okay. it really ends up what type of, what type of produce you're putting in there. Um, and it, I just, I don't want to send people down this rabbit hole of constantly going home and, and shuffling things around. But again, if you can create the two temperature zones where you're separating inside your fridge, where you're putting your cold veg with your cold veg and your warm veg with your warm veg, that's, that's honestly a start. The other thing is, which we haven't really gone into is um, ethylene gas, which is the ripening. It's the natural ripening hormone in produce. So it's what will turn bananas from green to uh to yellow so or when they go all black and spotty so actually one sec so the reason the reason why your bad bananas will go from like from the green to the mm -hmm. to the yellow and spotty is 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 from ethylene gas so it's gas that's emitted from the fruit as it as it naturally ripens but there's also um there's also some fruits and vegetables that they actually apply ethylene gas to kind of speed up their ripening so Things get a little bit complicated because we were talking about the temperature zones, but then when you're breaking down the produce within the temperature zones, you got to look at, uh, is it ethylene sensitive? Is it an ethylene producing vegetable? So things like broccoli and cauliflower, uh, kale, really ethylene sensitive. So you wouldn't want to put those right beside all your leafy greens and things like that because it would everything would start wilting. The, le the lettuce would start wilting. The, the leafy greens would start wilting. So um, that ethylene gas is just re really speeding up the the end game for all your produce so um yeah so i mean like other i guess the ethylene big ethylene producers would be bananas that's kind of the easy one uh tomatoes kiwis pears stone fruit um all ethylene producing uh, mangoes is another one um so you want to make sure you can put those together but they're going to ripen faster you know the trick too even people ask about how do you make the bananas slow down it's it's honestly breaking them off and the other trick is wrapping the uh wrapping the tip with saran wrap and that will actually slow the ripening process it's really hard to do in a commercial kitchen but if you're at home and you want to slow the ripening process definitely just uh, wrap saran wrap on the end um and yeah. take it off and, and that's where all that ethylene gas is coming out from the stem and i mean we saw on these we saw on these bananas why they get so black on the top is because all that's where all the ethylene gas is coming out so Oh wow! Because that that does work. That does work, TJ. I've done that with the wrapping, and holy cow, it stands a life majorly. Now, should you put bananas in a fridge? Where where should we put them? Hang them too? Should we hang? I've seen banana hangers. Yeah, so banana hangers for at home. If you have a banana hanger, it works works like a charm. If you're gonna break your banana apart, obviously we you can't hang a bunch of loose bananas on on the, the hanger. But when a banana is green. So, or, a, or in a breaking stage, which is the stage. So we have green breaking is kind of the middle zone where they're partially, partially yellow, partially green. And then we have the ripe stage where we're in a full yellow banana and starting to get some black spots or black spotting and getting that towards that direction. So when the banana is in the green stage or the breaking stage, you don't want to put it in the fridge because just because of the temperature zone. So bananas, you want to have them between, you know, that uh, bananas are around, I believe around 16 to 18 when they're ripe. 13, 16 when they're green. So degrees Celsius. So you don't want to put, you don't want to put your green bananas in the fridge. What'll actually happen is the bananas will go gray and they won't ripen. But when your bananas, let's say your bananas get to that ripe stage and people probably have heard me say that I say never put bananas in the fridge, but if they were at that ripe stage and you need to kind of, you need to push it for like half a day, a day, you could put them in the fridge, but you want to again, put them into the warmest part of your fridge because we don't want to push it back into that cold zone. So it's pro, like we were talking about produce is alive and there's so many different factors that we have to look at when we kind of talk about each, each thing. Um, the other one, the other one is onions and potatoes. So super, super common for everybody to store them together, but you actually, you don't want to do that because again, we got ethylene sensitive and ethylene producing. So it, what'll end up happening is if you have your onions by your potatoes, it's going to cause your potatoes to spoil. It's probably, and I'm, I was guilty of it. And, and we kind of alluded a little bit to this before, but you know, in my previous life, I was uh, I was a chef, and uh, I when I started the role I'm in right now as the produce specialist, I was like, okay, I have a general idea of produce when 
in reality, I know I knew nothing, and I've learned so much just about produce and and just the proper care and and what ex- kind of everything that it takes from the time they put the seed into the ground to the time that it gets into your fridge at home or to a, a customer mm-hmm. into their kitchen. So, um, but that's that's probably one of the most. Um, this is probably the keeping the potatoes and onions together. Everybody's probably guilty. Like, you know, honestly, I think everybody, even you guys probably do it at home, but it's kind of yeah, hard. I'm guilty right now, TJ. You <laughs> probably just together. ran off to your kitchen to kind of reorganize yeah. them. <laughs> but it's, they're, they're things you want to keep away from each other, but you, the problem at home is that you want to keep them in a cool, dry, dark area. So either that's going to be your pantry or maybe down in your, in your, uh, in your basement. So it's just doing the best you can to kind of follow all these rules. We don't, you know, and, and what we're talking about is just so we can extend the shelf life. That's the whole goal is extend the shelf life, extend the flavor. But there's other factors too. We, we didn't really talk about, we haven't touched on dehydration. So the refrigerator, what the refrigerator is always going to do is pull all the moisture out of all your product. So whenever you open the fridge, if, if we were to throw, if we were to throw, this is just half a romaine heart. If we were to just throw this loose in the fridge, and I, we pulled it out like a day later, which maybe I should have done we, just to show it would be really limpy because it's pulled all of the moisture out and it's, it's basically lost all that. So you can bring produce, some produce back to life. Um, you know, you can bring the, the lettuce, you can try to bring it back to life by putting it in cold water and it, it'll start absorbing some of that water. It won't go all the way back, especially if it's like really limpy. But the same thing would be uh, with celery. Um, everybody's seen limp celery. Everybody's seen, you know, like soft dehydrated carrots. It's really because it's in the fridge and it's exposed to the cooler. So it's, it's kind of important too to, you know, when you're keeping things in your fridge that you keep it covered, that you keep it wrapped mm-hmm. and you keep it, you want it to also be free of moisture because the things that are going to break it down, which we've kind of talked about, so we talked about the, the temperature. We talked about ethylene gas, which I'm sure there's going to be a couple more questions. Um, and that whole process of ethylene gas, we call it conditioning. So um, that's it's really the condition. They want to condition the fruit if they have to apply the ethylene gas so that it ripens properly. Um, and the other one being moisture. You don't you don't want to have moisture on your produce because if you put it in the fridge, it's it's going to start um, speeding up the, the breakdown of that product. And you don't want water sitting on product because that's what it, that's how a lot of times produce loses its aesthetic pe- appeal to it. So, um, and we can, we'll talk, I'm sure about that too, like, uh, the alternatives and number twos and things like that in mm-hmm. produce. But, so um, TJ, we have a couple of questions here that are coming through. So thank you yeah. for everyone sending them. Um, first of all, a big shout out. We got like, I'm telling you, New York to Knoxville, to Orlando, nice. all welcome to the show, Ontario North, uh, like outstanding, you guys are all here, so thank you so much for joining our show today. So we yes. have some questions, so keep them coming, Appreciate we got lots of questions here, but we have a great one. Um, can you slow the, can you stop the ripening of ban- bananas? Can you stop it completely? Well, that's kind of, um, Jay, we were kind of talking about that before. Yeah. I, I put it in my notes there where we talk about like the, you know, the ripening guide and, and how things kind of start from being like, you know, the green banana. We'll talk about a green banana. You know, the green banana would be like what would you, you'd call a stage one. And so there's there's seven stages in a banana, seven being the uh, our, our good friend right here. This would be stage seven. This is about a stage three. And then you would have like really green bananas. I'm just going to use this, for example, this is a plantain. So the green stage to a, to a number three, to all the way to a seven. So to slow it, to slow it down, that's bananas are such an interesting thing. And I'm sure there's somebody that wants me to talk about bananas. And if you ever want to go down a rabbit hole of information and geopolitical (laughs) drama and everything, look up what a banana is, look up what a banana is in itself, like the whole history of it. So I'm just going to do the the two minute spiel on bananas. All bananas are a clone of itself. So everything is the exact same. Every banana is the exact same. So bananas are almost going extinct in the world as well because uh, there's tropical, it's basically called TR3, tropical race three. What it is is a disease that affects the the chrome of uh, a banana tree and causes the tree to fall over. It's a soil disease. It spreads really rapidly. It affects a whole bunch of, it'll affect all the trees in, in a lot in a very short time. And so really the only place in the world that they're having major success right now and even growing bananas is in Central America. So the... Yeah, bananas are just a really interesting thing. So when they started doing all this, um, when really they they had a tropical race before, it wiped out um, the previous banana, which was the Gros Michel. The, it was called a Big Mike, and it was more or less it was bigger. It was big like the size of a plantain. So when they knew that it was getting eradicated, 
Um, they had already expanded. The banana production was so massive. They uh, are shipping bananas all over the world. Um, it's it's honestly a staple crop. Like it's one of those. If you look at even bananas now, it's it's very inexpensive. We're talking anywhere on sale for forty nine cents all the way up to ninety nine cents. If it's over that, you're paying too much, unless it's maybe organic. But um, they ended up having to come up with a new banana, and they were able to um, not through not through bad GMOs. And we're not going to really get into bad GMOs, but it's through selective breeding and, and crossbreeding of, of uh, varietals that are, are resistant to the TR3. They ended up with the Cavendish banana. And so that's, that's really the banana that we have. So the Cavendish banana is in trouble. So when they did this whole process, the bananas are set up to have about a seven to 10 day shelf life. And that's it. That's from the time that they are harvested on the, on the tree till the time they're going black. So there are certain things you could do. Temperature kind of helped it. Um, reducing the eth ethylene exposure can help reduce it. But really, bananas are on that track to, to go to black, like no matter what. So can you stop it? Not really, but it's you can do certain things. Like I was mentioning, we we're talking about breaking the bananas apart, wrapping the tops. That's kind of the only thing you do. And that's slowing the, the ripening process um, from the ethylene gas. But yeah, bananas are just wild. And they they honestly interest me and honestly blow my mind. So um but yeah, honestly, to slow them, not really. So they, like I was mentioning, they harvest them from the tree. They're green. They actually put them on a banana boat. That's uh, uh, they put them on a banana boat or put them into usually shipping containers with um, uh, in an ideal, almost in a dormant state. So they want it to be in an ideal condition where it basically goes to sleep. When they import the bananas into Canada, all the bananas are super green. Like they're very, very green. What they'll do is that's where they add that conditioning gas, the ethylene gas. They add that that step of um, basically encouraging the banana to say, hey, wake up, it's time to go and be yellow. But once that starts, fast track to, to dead, Deadville, like just gone. So not really, unless you're going to break them apart, there's not really much you could do. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so short answer uh, is no, if you got that. I was going to say, you can't stop it, you can slow that. it. <laughs> short answer, honestly, no. The five minute answer. Thank you for that. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So what um so when we talk about putting um different produce in coolers and stuff for restaurateurs, can we talk a little bit about that? Where is the best place to put these things? Yeah, like you, whenever you look at your fridge, obviously we we're talking about the temperature zones, the temperature ranges of where everything should go. Um, when you walk into your cooler, usually the reefer is at the very back, up at the top. It's blasting you with cold air. The coldest part of the of the cooler will be directly in front of that reefer unit. So. If it's if you have it on the side blowing out, it's going to be that wall on the side. If it's at the back, it's going to be that back area. The warmest part is going to be at the front. The warmest part of your of your uh, cooler will be where your cooler door opens because that's where it's sucking in all that that warm air and constantly pushing it. So mm -hmm. it's actually okay to store, like you know we were talking about, great place to put your citrus, amazing place to put your herbs, things like oregano, basil. They need to be in that ten to thirteen. Herbs are pretty temperamental. And another one, you want to make sure that's free free of moisture. You, They actually will, um, if you put a dry paper towel, if you see moisture, that will help extend your shelf life as well. Things like your dill or chives, because those are normally fairly wet. Um, but yeah, really at the front of that cooler, that's where you want to kind of put out, like I was mentioning, your citrus, your bell peppers could go there, your soft squash, squashes, your hard squashes could go there. Um, interesting one that, you know, is kind of a bit that we are kind of talking about. There's some, some stone fruit needs to be cold. Um, or sorry, some melons need to be cold. Uh, like, um, sorry, a honeydew needs to be warm, but a cantaloupe and a watermelon needs to be cold. So we usually, we like to bunch things in like group. Like I've kind of done on the counter. I got all my citrus together, all my stone fruit together. I got my brassicas together back here. So, you know, everybody, everybody just tends to put them together. But again, we kind of we talked about it a little bit before is that, you know, we love the look of it. We don't want it to go bad, but we're not taking those kind of the, the, the little bit of the extra step, that extra care, I guess, that that we should put into it. So, you know, and that's if you if you're getting a delivery, it's inspecting the inspecting the produce before you put it away in the cooler, putting mm -hmm. it away in the cooler as fast as possible, uh, teaching good habits to make sure that people are keeping the, the cooler door closed, um, using different temperatures, uh, thermo thermostats and thermometers uh, in various locations in your cooler so that where your fridge at home so that you know where uh, what your temperature zones are and you can create them. Um, there's a lot of great resource that we provide, uh, that Cisco provides, and there's also great resources that you can find online. And it just takes a little bit of digging to find what, you, you know, exactly what you're yeah. looking for. Um, you don't ever want to go down the rabbit hole of finding the answer. You don't want to look for the answer that you're looking for. You want to 
kind of find the facts, you know, maybe, and that's the thing with produce. You're always going to learn something. You're always going to find something new with produce. So um, I agree. Yeah. So I, I yep. think the big one, Jay, is, you know, our customer is a lot like us. We've got limited space, right, in terms of kind of getting everything kind of put away once you've got an order delivered. So it is just finding out, regardless of whether you've got a full walk-in cooler or whether it's just a reach-in, it's just understanding where the warm and cold spots are in that cooler. And then it's looking at things that are that are very sensitive to temperature. And, you know, a great one is is kind of a, a spring mix, a lettuce blend, an Arcadian blend. Uh, we see a lot of that, and that's one where we, we typically get challenged on. Unfortunately, it's one that a lot of people keep near the front of the cooler, right? It, it's used a lot. I think how many times we use a lettuce blend, especially during a lunch rush, right? It's just about on every other plate beside a sandwich. And so people keep it near the front because they want easy access. But of course, with a fridge door, open, close, open, close, your temperature is just going up and down like a roller coaster. And that's yeah. that's really going to affect the shelf life. So it's things like that. I think it's understanding, you know, certain things you want to keep in the packaging that it's delivered in. All of that is, you know, with micro perforations on the bags, it's all designed to help extend that shelf life. So there's certain things, and I get it, you know, we've all been in kitchens with limited space. There's certain things you just can't have a bulky box. I think it's just trying to understand what are good things that maybe you could take out and put in a bus pan, right, to kind of save mm -hmm. space. And what are things that you really want to kind of leave in the box, in the bag? And a lot of those lettuce blends are, are a great example of that where, Ideally, you want to leave them exactly how they came packaged to you, because that really is designed to to maximize shelf life for you. Yeah, yeah. And so, I think that, yeah. so go ahead, TJ. I was just gonna. That's excellent points. Exactly to what Jeff is saying. The you know we want to keep certain things in the box that it's that it's coming in, and usually if you're doing something in your cooler and you go in and inspect it, and things look shriveled or dehydrated. Usually it could be a storage issue. So those, those are the little signs that we need to look for or things that are rapidly breaking down in your cooler. It, it really could be because it's too cold. It's just rapidly breaking down. So we can see all various types of things and some great points by Jeff, even with this, the lettuce mixes, but also the whole head lettuce. We want to keep those in that, in that one to four range. And that's, again, when we're talking about the, the cold bedge, the warm bedge. Um, and in your fridge, there's, there's definitely the, the spectrum. It's not going to be ideal for everybody. Um, it all depends on the size of your cooler, like we talked about where the fans are blowing out. But even if you have to take it out of the box and it needs to stay covered, put, you need to get it into that container because it's just, there's no, we're basically paying, you're paying for something that you're just going to throw away. Like it's the, the equation is there. It's just, you know, you buy it, you improperly store it. It's not going to end well for you. So. So, so I'm going to throw this both to you guys is how much is the environment playing in factors of our produce quality? Is, is it huge? Like it, of, of what's happening? Cause I always yeah. hear it. It's like, oh, we're having a bad season down in California or some part of the country. Yeah. Is that, how how know, big is I'm, that? It, it's a massive piece, right? It, it, it's the one thing that we, we can't control. We can't control mother nature. Um, you know, these aren't cans of beans that can be replicated the same day, you know, from January 1st to December 31st. So obviously, you know, weather, market conditions, and it can be all over the map. So currently today we're experiencing wildfires throughout the Salinas Valley. So what that means for us is that, you know, at some point it's, it's maybe not going to be on today's order, tomorrow's order, but definitely, you know, you look a week, 10 days down the road, we're going to see the effects of that. So it's something that we really have to monitor and it's whether, you know, we're in the Salinas area, whether we're in Yuma, uh, we're kind of uh, Mother Nature's, uh, you know, it's up to her to kind of decide. And that really has a, a massive effect on the quality. And, you know, we put out little, you know, QA videos all the time. And it, it shows you the effects, whether it's heat. You know, we've also got some extreme heat going on in Salinas. So the heat will affect it one day. Uh, another day you might have too much, and too much moisture. There'll be some effects of dew. So you start to see a lot of these things and understand that it's, we can only do what Mother Nature kind of gives us. Yeah, and 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 I think the uh, environmental impacts are going to keep continue to adjust our produce quality throughout forever, almost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Just to touch on what Jeff is saying, I, you know, nothing like all of this, anything that we're talking about. I think is easily Google Googleable. Like you could Google whatever Google we're talking about. Google Googleable. If you even just speaking to, to Jeff's point, um, just talking about the Salinas Valley, the the Salinas Valley is south of San Francisco. It's basically a very um, temperate climate zone. It's the Salinas Valley starts at the bottom of a bay, 
Um, they just get that nice, cool sea breeze blowing down the valley. It keeps the temperature very temperate. So that's why they can grow. It, it enables them to grow the, a vast majority of the pros for all of North America. And I, I don't think people really realize that how much that the it's it's really that climate zone, how dependent we are solely on that climate zone. And and to Jeff's point, we're talking about the river, the river fire, or Jeff mentioned the river fire. That's it's now it's got to be well over it's over ten thousand acres. Um, and the, the way that obviously you know what a valley works, if the valley goes like this, they grow everything in the field. There's about a hundred square acres that if they look to the if they look west, the whole valley uh, ridge is on fire. And there, people are there mm -hmm. harvesting and pulling produce out of there. So even to kind of Jeff's point, is there's certain things that, and this is all because of the giant heat wave that they, they've had. So if the, the average temperature in Salinas, the ideal, they want around that 23 degrees, 25 degrees, so okay. They were 33, 35, 38 uh, at, the big, at the end of last week. Further down in the valley, they were hitting, you know, 44, 45 degrees um, Celsius. So it's well over 100 Fahrenheit, like just crazy, crazy temperatures um, that, that are going through there. And obviously you can't go to your garden, turn the dial on the sun up and just burn all, it'll just burn all of your produce. So um, kind of with the fires and the, the combination of the, uh, it's combination of the fires, we're actually seeing ash all over the product. And we don't really know how that's going to impact it. If it's going to, um, if it's going to uh, cover all the uh, cover all the cells on the on the leaves and cause it to break down, um, we don't really know these impacts. These are just things that we kind of face in produce every day. And even to the, the temperature, um, the temperature we're going to see all types of issues across lettuce, berries, um, all, peppers, uh, soft squash, uh, a lot of the crops. And this is also at a time that um, we're talking about growers that are growing food for us in a pandemic and. I mean, a lot of people, we're not really going to talk about this pandemic part, but when everything kind of went sideways in March, there's still all these farmers that have to plan all of their field months and months in advance. It's not like snap your fingers, throw the seeds at the ground, they have arugula or whatever. They, it takes time, takes planning. So knowing that we're going to go, we were going to be in this and potentially in a long time, there's a lot of people that consolidated what they were doing and are growing less. So we were kind of already faced with that. And that leads to further challenges because every year we all know it's, it doesn't say temperate climate really anywhere. There's only certain pockets of the world that kind of stay temperate throughout the year. But if we, it, they're going to leave from the Salinas Valley, once it, if it, the temperature drops, usually October, November, and they make the move down to Yuma, Arizona, and then they're growing down in the Imperial Valley, uh, down to Yuma in, in that, in that whole area around there. And that's really, they got to move to, to try to recreate the climate zone that was in Salinas just to mm -hmm. continually put out food. But we, we've, Jeff and I have seen, Jeff's probably seen a lot more than I have, but you know, I, I can tell you stories of the, we're getting pictures out of the greenhouses in Mexico and there there's snow and ice all over the greenhouses. And it's just things that, like Jeff had said, we, we can't control the environment. You, we can't control the wind. Um, wind is another factor that causes a lot of scarification on produce. And that kind of goes to where um, if we have ugly produce, there's some people that are okay with it and other people that are uh, not okay. The, the item itself is still all, all right. There's nothing wrong with it. It was just probably sitting and rubbing against a branch or one of its friends on, on the on the vine. So um, endless amounts of factors when you, we're talking about produce. We're, we're literally talking about something that is alive. We're hoping that we get the best sun. We, we hope we get some rain and the irrigation works fine and the, the, there's no water issues. Hoping to get this most ideal uh, piece of fruit or vegetable, usually after 60 or 90 days, mm. hoping for the best. And sometimes it, it just doesn't cooperate and it, it could be many, many things from, you know, like we were, the main thing is being weathered. Mm -hmm. So but there, there's also labor issues. There's tons of labor issues down in, in the growing fields. Uh, you know, like we're talking about, I, I mentioned that there's people working in the fields. Um, there's people that are working in the fields that are, they're also dealing with the pandemic, but they're in scorching heat and they also have to deal with this forest fire right there and doing a backbreaking job. So, um, I just think it's my whole point with that is just tr to treat produce a little bit nicer and uh, <laughs> just take a little bit more care and, and just remember where it came from. So, and, yeah, and yeah, there's also all the Canadian, the Canadian growers and sorry to cut you off Jay, but even the yeah. Canadian growers, I mean, we saw a very fast, rapid uh, cherry season, the blueberry season this year out of the Pacific Northwest. They, everybody, and doesn't matter where you are, you're all facing some sort of challenge. Um, you know, the growers in, the growers in Alberta were, were getting snow in September and it destroyed their mm -hmm. crop. Uh, it, there's endless amounts of environmental issues that we're always dealing with. And it's, it's also about finding the right produce as well and, and sourcing quality produce. So um, yeah, we, that's very important. 
we have a couple of questions here to G yeah. to Joe. Is there a bigger demand now that people are staying home or just the opposite on produce? Because we hear, we see it on the TV. There was the potato thing because restaurants are closed. There was not selling French fries. Is yeah. there a bigger demand? Like where are we at with that right now? The, just the, you were, we were kind of talking the potato thing. There's two, there's two types of potatoes. There's like regular table potatoes which you buy in the store and then there's, there's processing potatoes. So there was a huge backlog of pro processing potatoes amongst a whole bunch of other vegetables that kind of got left in the field and um, they just had to, to basically dig it under. So, you know, the, the one thing that I can tell you that how I look at it of people being at home and everybody, I think a lot more people um, were doing the home delivery. If they were going out buying their, their produce, they were grabbing what they could, but people were going home and cooking more meals for themselves. So me being a former chef, it's, it's, I find it encouraging that people are wanting to get back in the kitchen and cook. And that's going to help expand their horizons on, on different fruits, different vegetables, um, and just eating more of a larger variety of food, which is then going to encourage them to go back out to their favorite restaurant or somebody that's doing something that they like to cook and see, you know, maybe I can pick up some tricks from them. Maybe how much better are they doing it than me? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So has the demand gone up for produce? It's not really, it's kind of like a little bit of a complicated question because it's, it, I would say maybe the demand has gone up because we're in summertime. When mm -hmm. we first went into the pandemic, it was all root vegetables, carrots, potatoes, anything that was bagged was in any type of retail bag. That was mm -hmm. the hot, the hot items. And it was still anything that was going to last. Once we hit summer, it kicks into the summer veg. But the, the biggest thing that we're facing right now is, uh, is honestly the planting shortages just from COVID where the farmers didn't plant enough crops, oh, not wow. knowing what the demand is going to be. That, that is probably the biggest single factor that we've probably been dealing with for eight weeks, Jeff, out of nine weeks. And that's, when we talk about it, we're just talking about produce in general. We're talking about everybody is kind of in this, the same kind of COVID bubble. Yeah. Um, and that's, it doesn't matter where, where you're growing, you're impacted some, somehow, some way. There's also people have bought the seed or prepaid on their seed uh, in different areas. So there's just all that added costs and, and the, the growers need to do what they, what they can to um, stay, just basically stay growing. Because, so then we have, um, we have food next year kind of thing, food in six months and keep that cycle and keep that rotation going of produce. Yeah. Awesome. 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 So there's one more question here because then we're going to wrap it up or we'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyways, uh, there was um, the, the last great question and I'm thanks James for asking this question. The real debate, he said, uh, refrigerate tomatoes or not to refrigerate tomatoes. Great. Perfect. So we have to think about it again. We're talking about produce. So we got to think about many, many things. You got to think about where did it come from? So the reason I, I say that is because there's, there's multiple tomatoes that are in the, in the, in the market. I mean, we got, there's some grape tomatoes here, there's cherry tomatoes, there's round tomato, brown tomatoes like beef steaks and, and these rounds, these TOVs. The, uh, and there's also, um, uh, plum tomatoes, which is aroma. So if your tomato is grown in a greenhouse, so usually, you know, you would know your local brands, your local greenhouse grower, if you're buying it from um, a farmer's market, and they can tell you where it's from, if you cut into it, and it's red all the way through on, the, you know, that should be the indicators that um, keep your tomatoes on the counter. I mean, some people will be like, no, always in the cooler or always on the counter. We got to remember that if, if let's say we're talking about a tomato that's come from Mexico or California, which is a good majority of what we what we see in the grocery stores, what we see in restaurants, because of the the the, the production that they can output decreases the cost of it. So they're able, obviously, it's just that you know in that production cycle. So um, so if it's something that's from uh, the fields in California and Mexico, we got to remember that much like the bananas, they do the same thing with avocados. Um, they will actually ship the, the, the produce to Canada in a state of green or in tomatoes that could be pink. And then that's where they condition it with the gas to accelerate the ripening. So that's why when you, when you cut into like a greenhouse tomato, you'll see that it's going to be red, red all the way through. Usually if it's picked fine, ripe. If you cut into, if you buy a tomato from the store, you cut into it, it's going to be white inside. And that's because they're accelerating. They're just, they're tricking that tomato to, go from being pink to ripe in a couple of days instead of the oh, time wow. that it would be on the vine. So does wow. that kind of answer the question? And just one, here, one more as well. If we were talking like TOVs and this was the, if this was on the vine still, your bottom one, that would be your ripest one. And then you would okay. work your way back. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. 
So if I can, I'll throw in my two cents too, Jay, on, on tomatoes. How's that? <laughs> I'll let you. Yeah, I, 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 uh, thank you. So to me, I think what it comes down to is the application at the end of the day. So if I'm going to be slicing tomatoes uh, for sandwiches, subs, things like that, you might want them a little bit cooler, not cold, but chilled. I think it'll help slice them easier, which is going to maximize your yield. But if I was going to turn around, I was going to do, you know, this time here, a really nice tomato cucumber, tomato bocconcini salad. I definitely want those out uh, on the counter. It's going to help kind of improve the flavor profile. You know, we've all we've all tried it. You take a tomato out of the fridge, it, there's literally no flavor to them. Uh, but when you warm them up, you're going to start to get a lot more of those kind of flavor components coming out of the tomato. So I think a lot of it really has to do with how you, what, like what the end use is, you know, of the product. And it's the same with citrus. I think there's times if you're going to be slicing citrus, um, you know, bar maybe it's fine to have them cold they'll actually slice a little bit easier and you can slice them a little bit thinner if you're going to put it on the side of a glass but if you're going to be juicing you know citrus you definitely want that at room temp and the easiest way to explain that you're a saskatchewan boy right jay so the you think one. of exactly <laughs> and the secret's <laughs> out so the <laughs> easiest way to explain it is think of saskatchewan in february when you walk outside your door and it's minus 30 right the first thing you do is you you clench up tight Right. So if yeah. you think of a piece of lemon, if it's really yeah. cold, how much juice are you going to get out of it when you're when you're squeezing tight? Whereas if it's nice and warm, you're relaxed, you'll get a lot more. So I think when it comes to some of those, is it a fridge? Is it a is it a counter? I think you really got to look at maybe what the end use is, what the application. And from there, you can maybe it is about dividing it up. Half the case is going to stay out because it's going in mm -hmm. tomato salads. Half's going to go into sandwiches. So if, I, if it's a little bit cooler, again, not cold, but chilled. I think they'll slice easier with the knife and you'll maximize yield. So sometimes it's just about doing some of those things of really understanding what the end use of the product is going to be and then how you treat it. Yeah. And there is, you're exactly right. And I think from operators, um, the more that we can educate them in these things, it's really going to help them at the end bottom line. Right. And uh, sure. awesome stuff though, guys, I'm just, I'm a little speechless here just based on the, the knowledge that is I, like back to what I was saying at the beginning of our show, I thought I knew a lot about produce. I have no clue about produce that's out there and, and just what you can do with it. And, and for our restaurateurs out there and for our customers, you know, there is so much we're going to bring to you with these shows and just to help you out because it is definitely a cost. Obviously, we didn't talk about that. Maybe that'll be a little bit on the next show. Um, but we do definitely need to talk about the savings and waste. Waste is huge. And, and TJ, I'm sure you could talk all day about waste and how yes. to save waste and Tr what trim bins, it? right? Like I oh, had them right here in case it. we were going to cut. Always have bins ready for all your trim. And, and even to your point, sorry, I'm not a uh, 30 second interjection, but the uh, it's it's always saving your scraps, right? Like utilization yeah. of what you have. You, you shouldn't really throw away much of your produce. There's, there's items that are going to be higher yielding. Um, so like larger size fruit, like this orange yeah. will yield more than this, the, the smaller fruit. So this is the difference of a 138 count or a, and a 56. So if you're if you're looking for depending on what your, the application is, you're going to yield better out of a larger size fruit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's really in, in saving your scraps. I mean, if you if you're making gravy or you're making a soup or uh, you're doing your dinner veg, you, the scrap can end up going into a soup. It, we just want to get that full utilization of it out of everything that we do. And and one of the that we didn't really touch on is also the balance of what you're going to be putting on the plate. You don't want to take like all of your, you know, $2.50 per pound plus uh, items and be like stacking them on top of each other, like broccolini on top of asparagus with baby peppers and just keep stacking these potentially expensive vegetables. You want to have that nice combination of, you know, root vegetables, uh, turnips, rutabagas, anything. Uh, parsnips is a good addition. Yams is a good addition. Anything to bring the overall cost of that side dish down or give it really that balance. Um, people do it all the time with asparagus, and then you see bell peppers. If you do that in the spring, you're definitely going to be saving money. You got low costs on both of them, both of those times. So there yeah. is, and we'll get into that more because that, that's a really good part to discuss is more around, um, you know, plating and what to do within the restaurants and different fruits and vegetables that we can put on our plates. I know I've I remember having those discussions. You brought up some bad memories in the past when I was in Calgary. We used to talk a lot about that, like what's the right thing to put on the plate and how long. You know the perceived value as well changes right and yeah. there's, there's there's a lot of tricks there you can do as well so awesome stuff gentlemen for everyone else we're going to continue you. to bring more produce talks every second week we're going to have the guys back and uh, i think we got some surprises if i recall we're going to be maybe from different parts of the country 
maybe some parts down in the U.S. Absolutely. We're going to bring in people. Hopefully, we can get some farmers and people from the fields. Woo! For sure. Lots to learn about yes. produce here, folks. Live, awesome. Live from the Thank field. Guys. Yeah, right from the field. We're going to bring it to you. So, yeah. everyone else, thanks for joining. Um, our show, Virtual Kitchen Show, is every week. <laughs> I say that. Every week, <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's either 11 a.m. or 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we're going to continue. We have lots of shows. I think we booked number 70. We have 70 more shows coming up. Um, wow. Plus, we've got a lot of surprise chefs coming as well. Um, we're going to have a great time just being able to bring you some knowledge and some simple stuff right to your phone. If you want to watch on your phone or your computer, ah, whatever works for you. Um, all stuff. But thanks again, Jeff, TJ. Thanks, wow. Jake. Wow. Appreciate it. Um, your sous chef left, so we'll say goodbye to him next he's, time. He's um, bleeping now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys. Everyone else, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Get Jake. up there, support our restaurant, thanks, and go eat at a restaurant tonight, okay? We'll see you later. Thanks, guys. Thanks, DJ.